Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to the Abu Dhabi Festival presented by ADMAF, the Abu Dhabi Music and Arts Foundation. And welcome to the first in this year's series of the Festival Debates, Ruach al Fikr, in association with New York University Abu Dhabi. Tonight's discussion focuses on innovation and renewal in the traditional arts, an important historical element of mankind's perpetual cycle of creativity. To initiate the debate, our distinguished panelists are Dr. Khaled Azam, Director of the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. Founded by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, the Prince's School undertakes pioneering work in the realms of academic research, education, outreach and sustainable development, not only in the Islamic arts, but many other traditional art forms across the world. Kamal Kassar is the founder and president of AMAR, the Foundation for Arab Music Archiving and Research. Businessman, lawyer, composer and musician, Kamal created Amar in 2009 and today it is considered to be the largest Arab music archive in the Middle East. By the end of this evening, both institutions will be part of ADMAS network of international strategic partners. And in a change to the published program, we are delighted to have the prominent businessman, gallerist, and artist as our moderator, Mohammed Abdulatif Kanu. Now, on your headsets, there is simultaneous translation. Channel one is for Arabic, and channel two for English. Mr. Kanu, over to you. Thank you. And. Uh Welcome to the first Ruach al Fikr for the Abu Dhabi 2014 festival. Um, it's really uh, uh, an honor to be here with two distinguished um, uh, gentlemen uh, who I will introduce in a moment. However, uh, let me just run through some of the formatting. Um, we would like to have a discussion that lasts for about an hour. Um, Throughout this discussion, uh, we hope that this will inspire you to write down some questions so that following um, the formal part whereby we are discussing things uh, and, and continuing our discussion that we started out in the garden, which is very interesting, we'll have a question and answer session for about 30, 30 minutes after following the, uh, the uh, first part. So. The subject of this panel uh, explores, or it, it intends to explore, how uh, the traditional arts, both musical and visual, have been characterized by a long history of innovation. Now, I'm, I'm reading from this, so please bear with me. Um, this continues to the present day. It hasn't stopped. Our panelists will consider how the innovations such as musical scales, notation, instrumental design, architecture, design, geomet geometry have played and continue to play a core role in the creation, renewal, and preservation of traditional arts. Um, in keeping with the festival's theme of creative innovation, um, the heads of our institutions, our visitors, are pioneering efforts for the preservation and development of the arts we wish that they will be able to share their insights into the long and living history of innovation within the arts and music, and in particular, how it's relevant to us here. Um, the role of traditional arts in society is an interesting and complex one, as we all know. It might be said that traditional societies, architecture, music, visual arts, agriculture, carpentry, calligraphy, and pottery were artistic expressions that fully integrated both artistic and practical activities within society at large. The precious link between heritage and the present day continues to evolve and the inherent skills and knowledge fundamental to these arts form part of this culture, cultural and historical bridge. Um, Lisa already introduced our guest, um, so I would like to get right into it by asking each of them about the tradition. What is traditional arts to you? How do you um, interpret the definition of the traditional arts? 
are they frozen in time? Or do they have a contemporary relevance? Let me throw that out as the first question. Dr. Khalid? Um, if I speak as a teacher or an academic, which I'm not, by the way, but I'll try to do that. Because at the Princess School, we run um, academic programs. We run master's degrees and PhDs. We run postgraduate studies and research and so forth. Um, the first thing we do when we teach or when we try to establish a relationship with teachers and something we were sharing in the garden outside is we say we have to define the terminology of what we're going to talk about. Words suddenly mean many things. And the world we live in um, throws images or creates sort of illusions of what these words really mean. And the word traditional or the word tradition is one of the most used words that give you a feeling of, would you like a pizza or would you like a traditional wood baked pizza? Everybody goes for a traditional wood baked pizza. So that's, you know, we like a kitchen, we try like a traditional kitchen that's made this way. So somehow in our psyche, the word tradition has a certain relevance in terms of quality, in terms of whatever. But let's put that aside for the moment. But the way we define tradition is we say each community has its own traditions. It has its own mannerisms, it has its own culture, it has its own way of doing something. And that's on one level. But the way, while we are called the school of traditional arts, and the way we see tradition, the way we define tradition, and I found the best way of defining it is what the Buddhists call the right way. It's of its time, it is of its place, and it's always of its time and of its place. It is what comes natural. When, whenever we give references to, to, the, to the ultimate tradition in, in, in the way we teach our students, is we always refer things back to the order of nature. We say, flowers follow the season. The seasons are there. They, they bloom, they blossom. Some flowers are fivefold, some flowers are fourfold. They follow, their, they're true to themselves. And that's what we as human beings forget sometimes. We follow this, we do this. Or they are true to themselves. They blossom at the right time. Another thing, snowflakes. Nothing that you see around here, but it's a very interesting thing. All snowflakes are sixfold in nature. They're all, the symmetry of them is a sixfold nature. But no two snowflakes are ever the same. Nobody has ever seen two snowflakes that look the same. So the snowflakes come from their tradition, the, the truth of their being. So we as artists have to discover what is our true being, what is our true nature, and work from within that, and that is tradition. It is something which is universal. It is something which is primordial. Come on, what do you think? Do you agree with uh, Dr. Khalid? Yes, sure. Uh, tradition is something that is a conventional way of thinking someone's history. In the music field, uh, many people think that when we speak about the Mashah of Andalus, that, that is performed now, that it is related to the Andalus of the 11th century, which is totally wrong. Why? It is wrong because in the music we don't have any notation. We don't have any reference to the way the music was performed. We, all the books that was written by Farabi or Ibn Sina or others were how instruments uh, sound how instruments are created, mm. how, how long is the chord, how can we apply 
such uh, uh, threat to the uh, loot. So technical specification. So technical specification, but no indication of any kind of music. Description of, of of tradition I found was what the Buddhists call the right way. If it is the right way, if it's of its time, if it's of its place, it will not die. If you plant the wrong plant in a different environment, it will die. So what we're trying to plant for the future are plants that are of this place and of their time. Unfortunately, we live in a very complex world where things are moving in such a different way, where people aspire to create identities because they think these identities are more sophisticated or they are better for us, so let's have some of that as well. And they are completely losing what they're about. The most tragic case I saw was in China. You know, we run a program in, in Beijing and in Shanghai, and I was teaching at the China Academy of Arts. And we said that we would like to run a two-week workshop with the architecture students. My discussion with the China Academy is that, why are you trying to teach your young people to become Western, or European architects? Why, why are you doing this? Because all the things I saw on the wall, and to be really honest, were second rate, were second rate copies of really mediocre European architecture. I see with all this that you have in this country, you're trying to be this, it is completely illogical. We ran a two week workshop about simply about the language of decoration in Chinese art and architecture. And I was amazed that there wasn't a single student who knew anything we said. They didn't know a single symbol, they did not know a single element of the, they said, we're not taught this. So what is the responsibility of that generation to hand on to their future? What are they, ha they're handing on a, a mediocre copy of a false copy. It really is tragic. Yeah, but to be, to be fair, I mean, uh, I'm sorry? the Chinese went through a cultural revolution that destroyed a lot of, True. you know, and this is a second generation that was affected by that. So they would have no collective memory of, of a pre. Oh, no, they do, they do. Because when you talk to the academics in China, they tell you, this thing is six centimeters high and it's green, red, and yellow, but there's no significance beyond that. There really is no cultural significance. A civilization has to be understood on many levels, and that's the value of preserving civilization. The first thing a civilization preserved is on a physical level. Does this physically exist here? Is it functional? Is it practical? You know, does it make our lives more comfortable? And then if civilization has to exist on a social level, is that we are a community. We're a community in this room or in this town or in this city or in this country, and we relate to each other as a community, where there is an interaction between us that makes our lives complementary. And therefore, if this complementarity does not happen, we're not a community. And then the civilization has to exist on a, on, on a cultural level, it says, what do we do here today and now will have resonance into the future, just as the things we've seen in the past have resonance for us today. So we have to be careful about what we're doing, because it's not just about our little town. It's about what we leave, and the, it's, it's the echo we create. And then most of all, the civilization has to be understood on the universal level, is how do we fit into this timeless flow of consciousness that has been created in this world for us, which will go on way beyond when we die and was there way beyond where we before, before us. And how do we find the inspiration of what we are by, by tuning in with that, by being in harmony with that? So it's all these complex things. It's not just about a building or, a, or this, right? it's, it's about how do we see, how this correct. And, and yet in China, they have a term which is very similar to what you said about the national treasure. They talk about intangible heritage. And I, I love that term. I didn't understand it initially. But they talk about intangible heritage. The tangible heritage are walls, temples, columns, and whatever. The intangible heritage is that collective consciousness that makes a civilization. It's not visual, it's not oral, it's, not, it's just a collective consciousness. And that's what tradition is about is tapping into that collective consciousness 
And when you play music, you play it in this way. When you do architecture, you do it in this way. When you dress, you dress like this. When you eat, you eat like this. And these are your, ma but it, it, it develops not collective consciousness. Our collective consciousness has become a global collective consciousness with no real particular identity. You find young people in China living art artificial lives. You find young people in downtown Cairo who have aspirations they're never going to fulfill with ambitions that are totally relevant to them, which lead to frustrating lives. So we, we really have to question what are we preserving and what are we handing over as well. Also, uh, I think that uh, tradition uh, is also very subjective. Uh, look, uh, in Lebanon, you have the traditional houses mm. that are the three arches, three arches that have three mm. arches. This is Venetian. This is, this, is a a, a, this is Venetian that was brought in the 18th century. But it is considered as very rooted, a very rooted tradition. Something say, very subjective. Did you say Venetians or did Ven you say Venetian? Venetian, yes. Venetian. 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 Yeah, if you look from at the, Venice, from Venice, the, not the from palaces Tunisia. of Venice, are, they, okay. they are the same model right. as, as they yeah. have here. But you know, one thing I might just comment on that. There's a difference between, when we look at tradition, between tradition as a principle or the forms that this tradition has taken. So a tradition might flow in a, in a region for a while, and it takes on the Venetian model, it takes on other models. So these are traditional forms, but they were all relevant to that place as well. They mm -hmm. all fitted naturally into it. So when we talk about a tradition, a tradition takes on forms. But there's also a principle of tradition which is much higher than which is that continuous collective consciousness that mm. people draw from. And unfortunately, what we interpret tradition today is because we get stuck on these forms. And these forms become historical, they become subjective. You know, we enter into that whole debate of, uh, you know, the, I think what, what, what's more interesting is to say, what is the collective consciousness that was there? And why did sure, these people do it? Sure. And that gives us a much better understanding of what tradition sure, is about. Sure. We have a question from this young man here at the end who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, uh, the first one. Okay. What will be considered art in 50 years' time? Traditional art in 50 years' time. And the other one, uh, it might be like a theory. It's like a theory. I, feel, I felt it, and then when I ask some people, they, they see the, sa the same thing, which is w when I see art, I consider it something that comes from the soul of the person, of which may, we may call an artist, from his soul of, or from his unconscious mind. But when we invest in this artist, and when he will start to create art for the sake of money and sake of fame, I think art is lost here, or art, art is dying this way, when we are investing in it. Very true. Thank you. 50 years from now, 50 years. 50 years is a short time. <laughs> That's in the long term. In the long, in the um, long term. Well, I mean, in in I, I, I see a lot of hope. I see for the Arab world, because we are Arabs, and I see in the Arab world, there is something that happened in my grandfather's generation and in my father's generation. My father was an architect as well. and. He tells me that as he was growing up as an architect, there was such an energy and a force to move things in a certain direction. He said it was impossible for us to do anything else. There was such a strong will to move towards this modernist architecture that was happening. And that was like a wave that came and, and, and you see the results of it. You, you, you drive down. Saudi Arabia, you see Swiss villas, you see this, you see, I mean, it, it, it really was schizophrenia that was, that was happening. It was a society that suddenly had the means to do things, but did not hold on to the ground it was standing on to say, this is what I do in relation to this world. They had to buy this credibility. But that's calmed down now. You know, that's gone through a cycle and it's calmed down a bit. And there's the next generation that says, well, we saw where that took us. You know, it didn't really take us very far. And we go back a little bit more and say, 
and there are other initiatives that are saying, let's go back a little bit more, let's look at, the, and, and, and the one thing that's going to save young people, which is something that my generation never understood, in fact, is this concept of the sustainability of the natural world, is the impact we have on the natural world, and that's something that is a priority for the younger people today. What do we build? How do we build it? And ultimately, what is our responsibility response to this natural world? The second question that you talk, asked is also very perceptive, and I like that question, because it goes back to what I said earlier, is that what is the intention of the artist? You know, the intention of the artist is not to be a superstar. The intention of the artist is not even a choice. You don't choose to be an artist, you're born to be an artist. You are born with that perception, you're born with that consciousness, you're born with that sensitivity, and it's a great, great responsibility. And if you, if, if, if you follow a commercial initiative, or if you, if you follow a social initiative, you're not following your right inspiration. But that's very difficult. We are human beings, and I, I never judge people on others because we're all under pressure to do certain things. Certain things. Start from out, do you have any comments? Yes. Uh, the view 50 years from now, I think that the history is not a, a straight line. And I think that in history, there is a lot of development and a lot, lot of setback. So we cannot forecast anything. I give you a simple example from my world. A uh, couple of years ago, I attended a conference here in Abu Dhabi uh, about music. And there was a, a musicologist from Nigeria. He made a statement that was, that was shocking. He said that between brackets, Nigeria is one of the most uh, rich country in uh, music. They have a huge tradition and a big, uh, uh, there, was, there is a big repertoire of big archives in Geneva of uh, uh, many tribes, music, very, very rich. He said that the Yamaha keyboard replaced all the instruments in Nigeria. And that even the people who made the traditional, the, who used to make the traditional instrument are making them, uh, are no more working. So this man was trying to recreate some groups to play the traditional music with the traditional instrument. You see what setback it, 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 it happened. Mm. I mean, nobody can forecast how, how things would be in 50 years. This is my uh, But you have view. to hold on to the origin of something. People don't understand. The people say, why don't you just draw geometry on a computer? It's much easier. Why do you always have to draw it by hand? And exactly the same thing as the Yamaha computer. There is a process of investigation. There is a process of improvisation that the instrument itself gives you and that you have that interaction with the instrument. And that is creativity. When we draw geometry on a computer, I'm putting an instrument, I'm putting a point, I'm creating a circle. I am not interacting. These things are completely detached from me. When I'm drawing geometry by hand, I am seeing relationships. I'm unfolding something that comes from myself. And I'm the one who's in control, and something is speaking to me. I'm not detached from it. When you play music on a Yamaha thing, it is not the same as playing things. That interaction is not there. And that's where the art dies. That's that you, you can preserve it. You can write software to do it for you. But that human spark that comes out of 
that, that creativity dies very, very quickly. And that's a great danger for the future. Mm. These are tools, but they're not creative tools. Let me ask another question. There's, sorry, this lady and then. Um, I'd like to ask you about Makamat. Makamat. Makamat, yeah. Um, is this on? Oh, okay. Um, now, the, the Makamat, of course, it it's, uh, develops, in, in my mind, I, I associate it with the oud, which is an instrument that has no frets. And so it's actually, the makamata are almost, well, they're impossible to convey with um, Western notation. So they've been learned from one person to another. They, a human being has to teach you your makamata and your makam. And presumably that, um, that, that, that network of learning goes back many thousands of years in this region. So aren't we living in, it's not an interrupted uh, musical tradition, it's actually a living, vibrant musical tradition that is shared through, through the learning and, and dissemination of the makamat. Uh, you are right. You are right. Uh, the learning, the teaching of music is the way of transmission. It's not the notation. Uh, because uh, the word of maqamat, the word of mu oriental musical system, is a world where uh, the way of playing is how you are taught, and not is how you read, it's how you are taught. And this is why uh, in the development of the commercial music, of the everyday's music today, there is a shrinkage in the use of makamat. For example, uh, the use of makamat is about four or five makam that, it, that are generally used because it's handy, it's very easy to compose, it's very easy to, uh, to teach, it's very easy to uh, play. But uh, it takes out the richness of, of this world. It takes out the richness of our music. So yes. Uh, I, I used to learn uh, Nai with my uh, teacher. And some movements, he could explain it to me by playing and by showing me how he places his fingers to, uh, to produce a certain uh, uh, detail. This cannot be read in the book. This should be shown by the, by the professor, by your teacher. And if your teacher is good, you are good. Yeah, sure. That network, that, that network is disseminated across this region. Sure. And, and, and lives as, as, as long as people play together. Sure. The, the, I don't, I'm, I'm troubled by, by your argument that there was an interruption in the 19th century. Well, uh, we, some, uh, some theorists say there are thousands of makam thousands. Some say there are hundreds of makam. But we know that there is lot, there is tens of makam. When you go to the uh, conservatory and you want to 
play an instrument or to lear learn music, they don't uh, teach you all that. Why? Because the, there are some teachers that are the real depository of such science. Because this science is lost. It is lost. It is lost because it is not practiced. It is lost because they are composing on piano. It is lost because they are uh, uh, using uh, keyboards. It's lost because the head of the department of, uh, of uh, the conservatory in, uh, in Beirut, uh, he canceled the violin oriental uh, teaching, he said, we have a, viol a, a occidental uh, class, go and learn occidental uh, violin. So there is a lack of knowledge. There is a lack of practice. There is a lack of uh, will to, uh, to, to, to make this rich music uh, live. So it is fundamentally an educational issue. Sure. And education relates to value of education. What can I do with my degree? What can I do with my studies? Can I convert that into something that will generate a job or get me a job so that I can live? Um, I like what you're saying about the spirituality of it. But how do you add a value? How do you give a value to the spirituality aspect of it, of the human interactivity, so that you can transmit it from generation to generation moving forward. This is, uh, this is of importance to us because we can spend a lot of money building beautiful schools and universities and whatnot, but what are we teaching in them? This is, I think, a, a very important point. I, I think, I mean, that's just my opinion. We don't add anything to spirituality. It's spirituality that adds value to our lives. The world of the spirit exists in a dimension that we don't interact with on a daily basis. But if we can open parts of our lives or moments or less to that world, we are enriched as human beings. It's not a subjective world, it's an objective world. And if we can add anything to do with education that can do that, is how do we prepare young people to face that world? How do we prepare young people to be conscious of that world? Because you can't do it on your terms, you have to do it on the terms of that world itself. So when I say we teach craftsmanship, and I said, I'm, I'm going to repeat a story that I said to you earlier because it might be relevant to you. When I was a young architect, I used to work for a really disciplined man. He was really tough and quite unpleasant to work with sometimes, but he was, and I appreciate it because he was a brilliant architect. And one day I lost my cool and I said, why are you always so damn difficult? Why can't you just let it happen? Why can't you just let this go? And he said, because I see something in you, and I want to teach you perfect technique. It has to be perfect technique. Because one day, when you're 40, you will see something. And if that technique is not there in you, you will not be able to bring it through. And I owe a great debt to that man all my mm. life, because he made me aware of that. We don't know when inspiration will come. We can't force inspiration to come. But if we are blessed with a moment where we see the truth of things, should we be prepared. We have to be prepared for it. Yeah. And we might live a whole life without having that blessing. That's fine as well. There is no ego to sort of will it. You know, we do. We live through lives that way. We live. We live a truthful life by being conscious of what's there and saying, "Please open to me. I am ready. I'm working hard here." Come. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, then it's not up to you. You will never force inspiration to come. You might deceive yourself by thinking it, it's come. But if it doesn't come, let it. But if it comes and you're not ready for it, that is where this young man's question is very relevant. Because what is the artist? 
his role is to be ready to bring this through and share it with his community. I agree. This lady had a question. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Khaled, I would just would, I would like to echo what you just mentioned, what you just uh, spoke about. Muhammad, you asked about how can we give value to all this. I again say it is education. When something becomes relevant to me, it means something to me, it becomes valuable to me. And I would protect it and I will do everything I can to protect the other achievements. You know, achievement of people in Palestine, achievement of people in, in Turkey, in, 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 in England, because it means something to me. And our when we are talking about, again, what, for your question, it's really, again, the key is education, 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 Muhammad. Uh, I would like to say something else here. Uh, Dr. Khaled mentioned uh, one of his teachers, the one who was very tough maybe on you, on him, and the same story happened to me when I was studying abroad. I wanted to drop my uh, classical music appreciation uh, courses, and he said, you don't drop it. Keep it. I said, I don't, I don't read solfege. All the class reads solfege, and it's very hard for me. He said, you in particular, you don't drop because you have something and you'll discover it later. And he was right, and he didn't drop it. Oh. I didn't, the same when we used to have the uh, uh, art history classes. It was very tough for me. I don't, I, you know, I didn't study art at school. And again, he said the same thing. Once you know the value of what you're doing, you will appreciate it and you'll take it somewhere else. He foresee maybe what we were, sure. but uh, this is what I wanted to say, education, thank Muhammad. Thank Sorry, I spoke too much. Sorry about uh, last. Uh, uh, this will be the last question unless anyone raises their hand quickly. There's okay. Also, there's also this lady and then this gentleman for a final question it. after that. And there's also, sorry, Mr. Khan. And there's, oh, sorry. And then okay. the bonus question for the lady in the back. <laughs> okay. Um, my question has to do with uh, the definition of tradition. When we do um, innovation in some traditional art, is there a danger, some kind of threshold that we should not go past? Because if so, then we would be in the non-traditional art. If, if, if such, then what is it? And if I go back to your first, uh, Dr. Khaled, your first introduction of traditional being everything that is natural, you associated that with the natural flow, with the nature. So from the way I see it, everything that is done by a human being, it is natural. So it can only be traditional because of, I mean, the perception of the human being of his surroundings, of his experience, his or her, of course, experience. And, and then uh, what they try to do should, can only be natural and, and hence can only be traditional. And then there's another part also that I'm thinking of it. Tradition, is it a fixed term? or it's something dynamic that the tradition for me is what was there 100 years ago. So the tradition later would be the tradition of the tradition or what we have now. So where, where does tradition stop really? Sure. Thank you. I, mean, the, I, I think I mentioned this a bit earlier on. One has to differentiate between the term tradition and traditional forms. Um, I think there is, when, when we teach tradition, what we have seminars and discussions with our students, whatever, we try to teach tradition as being a universal consciousness. It's a universal consciousness of being part of the order of nature, it's of, of doing the right thing in the right moment, right time. And then there are traditional forms. There is Nick Tiles, there's this, there's music, there's, you know, Maqamat and all these things. These are just traditional forms that emerged from a certain people with this consciousness at that particular time doing certain things. So we have to be careful between what the form is and what the process is. I am more interested in the process and I'm more interested in the process today because we live in a very complex world where people, you're right, people look at different things in the past and say, why should I do this? This is no longer relevant. So they mistake the concept of tradition with a historical form. That, that I think, 
should be clarified. But I'm going to ask you a question because your, your point is interesting. You say everything a human being does is... is